Faces dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. It's a Thursday. It is draft day in Major League Soccer, the Super Draft. We'll start this afternoon. We'll keep you posted on everything going on with that. We'll get you ready for it this morning. Kevin Egan's going to join us at 10 o'clock. Kevin and I are doing a draft recap show for Atlanta United that will post on their social media channels this evening. Uh, we'll talk to draft picks, hopefully, and uh, depending on what they do, they might not have draft picks. We'll talk about that if that's not what happens. We will talk to Darren Eels and Carlos Bocanegra as well. We'll also talk to uh, the head coach at Wake Forest about Machope Chole, the new homegrown signing for Atlanta United. So lots of stuff coming up today. Kevin will join us here this morning at 10 o'clock to talk about that, and we might ask him about a couple of other things. Uh, while he dashes in and dashes out quickly. It's a lot of things to talk about. Zinedine Zidane is in trouble in Madrid. Uh, He might see the season out, but losing to a third division team in the Copa del Rey, not exactly good for your job security. Musical chairs at the top of the Prem. Uh, Manchester City was there for a minute. You had three teams at the top yesterday. You had Leicester at the top going in. You had Manchester City. Then you had Manchester United, who came back to beat Fulham. Talk about an offside decision that's got a lot of people riled up. Um, IFAB really needs to rewrite these laws for the modern game because this shows you the loopholes in the laws. It's kind of similar to something we've talked about a few different times over the last few months. Well, we'll get into it as we go. Uh, John, where do you want to start today? Oh, wow. Um, see, I, ah! I feel like I ask you that at least every other day. I don't know why it's such a surprise. Well, I mean, for me, I guess it would be uh, Zinedine Zidane and Neil Lennon, I guess, would be my one and my two. Oh, you had to bring Neil Lennon up. I did, because Jared is still fired up. I'm fired up. The guy's acting like a total plonker. Yes, like, it, it, plonka. It makes no sense why he is being so ridiculous. What a plonker. So, real quick, because we're not going to spend a lot of time on on Neil Lennon. They drew with Livingston yesterday. Um, Second place is not a guarantee for Celtic at all. This is a club legend who is basically holding the job hostage at this point. He said, I won't walk away. Absolutely not. I've put too much into this, too much of my life. And a month ago, we won the treble. Yeah, because that game was postponed. It really doesn't, yeah. you know, anyway. You beat a second division team to do that, too. But anyway, uh, we've lost two games in the league. Europe wasn't good enough, and we're out of the League Cup. But we're human beings, and we haven't played well for whatever reason. So he doesn't know why. That's always good. That's a, that's a good yeah. thing to put out there for you. Uh, he hasn't changed anything. So, you know, of course it's not him. I'm fed up answering it, really. Everyone is interested in my job. You keep asking if I'm going to be here. I will be here until I'm told otherwise. Um, Yeah. There have been many fans who don't support me like that since I got the job. But we've won five trophies out of six. Not bad. You're supposed (laughs) to, Neil. Yes. You're Celtic. You're supposed to win those trophies. You're not supposed to be 20 points back. From the top of the table right now. You're not supposed to be there. So people are asking because of that. And people are asking because your team looks awful. And Uh your captain, your beloved captain, Scott Brown, comes on as a substitute and gets sent off, what, seven minutes later? Five minutes later. I'm giving him more credit. Yeah. For a (laughs) stupid, childish, ridiculous decision to go with a spinning back fist on an opposing player. It's, it's It's a total joke. And this is what happens at times when you go down the well and with all the coaching changes, we've talked about it, um, when you turn to a club legend. Now, I've never seen a club legend say the things that Neil Lennon has said, ever. I've never seen a club legend say, I won't walk away, absolutely not. That's so opposite from how most club legends handle the club they're a legend at because Mm -hmm. there's a respect there. You can't argue that being 20 points out of the top spot when you are supposed to win everything is acceptable. You can't argue that. You can't point to things that you did in the past. You you can't do that. Not if you're a legend. There's a higher expectation for the way you handle it. 
that's my biggest issue with, with his comments and what he's doing. That doesn't even get into going to Dubai and how bad that looked and then no. you know, attacking people for questioning it and all, all the ridiculous stances he's taken. He needs to walk for the good of the club that he is a legend at. He is disrespecting the club by acting the way that he is. I would, not, I would never expect Frank Lampard to say things like this if his job gets more into question at Chelsea. I, I do not think Frank Lampard would act in this way because I, I think he's a, a more respectable person. I, I, I would never expect him to do that. I wouldn't expect Zinedine Zidane to do this. And he didn't when he was questioned about it after losing to a third division team in the Copa del Rey yesterday. He didn't say these kinds of things. It, it, it's, it, it's absurd. Like, if you don't want to say, like, yes, I'm going to walk away, that's fine. Don't start saying, I'm fed up answering it, really, and, and absolutely not. I put too much into this. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't act that way. Just say, look, it's not my decision. I'm going to do the best I can because I love this club. I want to get it right just like everybody else. You know, I'm going to work as hard as I can until I'm told I'm not in the job anymore. Yeah. Leave it at that. Don't get this way about it because you're disrespecting the club. It's, it's sad. Uh, Zidane... Zidane would walk away. Zidane would walk away. I mean, he would walk. Lampard would walk if it gets to that point. You know, that's what that's what legends are supposed to do. And Neil Lennon ha- has ruined his legacy at Celtic with his attitude. Anyone more than would anything. walk away. Good God, anyone should walk away. Jesus, it's Christ. so bad, Jarrett. You're, you're, I, I start <sighs> ranting about Neil Lennon, and, and you appear. I understand why. It's, I mean. <sighs> I don't even know what to say anymore. It, it just it blows my mind the ridiculous attitude from him at this point. One of my favorite things about living in the United States and cheering for a team in Europe is that I get to wake up every morning at about 7.15 to a child who comes bursting through my door like she's got a no-knock warrant <laughs> and jumps up into bed and wants to like talk about the nature of the universe and black holes and all that jazz. Um, because I made the mistake of showing her like science videos, but then I pick up my phone and it's always one of the first things I see is, Oh, let's see what Neil Lennon's done today because it's morning here, but it's lunchtime over in Europe. Let me see what he's done. Oh, Oh, oh he did something dumb again. Ah, I got to start laying prop bets that he's going to say something dumber and dumber every day. <laughs> I could, I could have bought the damn team by now. And then around lunchtime, when I take a break from work, and check like oh let's see oh, oh, oh it's nighttime it's evening over there evening press is coming out oh he's done something else dumb and uh, it's the only person who has played for a Celtic team that's made the last sixteen in the Europa League in the Champions League and who has also managed a Celtic team into the last sixteen of the Champions League and he's taken that legacy and has just smashed it into pieces that like it, it's not pieces you can put back together now. Mm-hmm. Like, you just got to get the dustbin out and toss it in the trash and hope the insurance claim is settled on it. That's about it. it You're it, done. It should be that way. I mean, he's not going to be there next year. There's just no way that continues. I, I'm, I'm not no. buying that. But, you know, this would be the kind of situation that you have a, 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 a ceremony to honor, uh, you know, one of Celtics' legendary teams that he was a part of down the line. And you should be like, man, what are people going to, how are people going to react if we invite this guy? I don't, I I think it'll get washed away. Yeah, it it does. It really does. I think it'll get washed away. I I do think that it's very beneficial for him that there are not fans in the building right now. Um, But it's, it's ruining a a very proud legacy. And, And that's what is maddening watching it. And it, it is it is one of those things where context is everything, and the way you're handling the things is everything. Because this Rangers team is a better team that you're playing against that is virtually locked up the league now. Like they're going to have the league title in hand by the time they come to uh, Celtic Park. But if you had, if you hadn't been such a dick about everything, <laughs> and <laughs> and if you had just kind of kept your nose to the grindstone, said the right things, played, and you know, let's say you lose the league by. Uh, nine points. You lose the you lose three matchups with the old firm. Um, 
and let's say you lose it by nine points or something, but the rest of the season's respectable. I mean, I think that's one where at the end of the season you can say, uh, we gave it our all. We didn't win 10 in a row. I'm going to bow out now. And everything is, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's better. There's now, respect. It's just, now it's just awful. Absolutely yeah. poison the well. Yeah, it's done. And uh, my favorite thing yesterday was watching everyone lose their mind and laugh about, yeah, good thing you took that, uh, that week trip to Dubai so you could get ready to go play where it was 34 degrees and snowing in Livingston yesterday. Yeah, there's that. All, yeah. all that warm weather training did great when you had to go play. Like Livingston had to clean the field like it was Green Bay before the game. Then it started snowing at halftime, and by the, like, the 80th minute, like, you couldn't see the lines. Yeah. It, right. But good thing you went to Dubai. A lot of yes. good that did you. Um, the uh-huh. irony also of that Dubai trip is that, and he does make the point, like, in past years when they've taken the Dubai trip, they played better when they came back. It actually, whether or not that is correlation or not, right? it they actually has happened in the past. This year, before you went, you were playing well. You lost the Rangers one nothing before you went in a game where you were better than them. For 80% of that game, you were unlucky not to be leading at halftime, and Rangers scores their own goal. That happens. You had been playing really well. Since you come back from Dubai, you haven't won a game. Have your team went to quarantine. Um, you still can't defend. It's Nothing has been good about it. And to sit here and keep defending it and not saying, well, you know, in the past, it, it easily could have said, hey, uh, you know, in the past we did this. And, you know, it's worked in the past, and we thought this year we could use it to really spark ourselves, but that hasn't worked out. It wasn't the best decision. We apologize to the fans and to everybody that, you know, we we had the best of intentions, but it didn't work out. It's not that hard to come up with a statement like that. It's really not. No, it's a lot easier than attacking everybody who's asking you a valid question. Uh, people are wondering if you are hitchhiking. I thought he was playing Frogger. I hope not. Uh, no, I just, I just, I, I just go take walks around the neighborhood because because of Neil Lennon. It's fun to just get out. It's just <laughs> fun to get out and stretch my legs when thinking about Neil Lennon because then I'm not sitting still around things that are sharp. <laughs> that, that's a good idea. Um, let, let, we've we've, we've, man, we've it's, talked. It's dumb. We've yes, and we've talked enough about dumb things. Um, let, let's move on to a team. Let's talk about some positive. Yes, a team that's well, it's not positive, but it's uh, less dumb. Real Madrid. And their loss in the Copa del Rey. It, like, this team hasn't looked like Real Madrid all year. And when you're losing to Alcoyano, uh, who is down to 10 men in extra time, who's in the third division, uh, that's a problem. Zinedine Zidane said afterwards, I take responsibility and whatever has to happen will happen. Uh, according to Marca, they are not going to make any drastic decisions. They're, they're not going to make any decisions in the heat of the moment. They'll wait till the end of the season to uh, launch a new Real Madrid with some of the, the big names moving on. And it goes back to our conversations about Sergio Ramos. Is he going to be there to be part of this new Real Madrid, or are they going to completely break with everything? Uh, they're not planning on anything yet with the coaching decision. They're, they're not going to fire him and then go into the market right now. He's not planning to resign. They're not planning to fire him. They have a left, the league, which doesn't look good. Atleti, I, I think, has a stranglehold on the league. And the Champions League. And I wouldn't consider Real Madrid a favorite in the Champions League right now at all. So... How drastic of an overhaul do you think Real Madrid needs? Now, the, the, the landscape in Spain, we've talked about Barcelona plenty. We know that they're going to have problems for a while. This is not going to get fixed in, in one transfer window. Atleti, after potentially moving on late last year, decided to stick with it. They're going to benefit from it. They should be the top team honestly, for a couple of years. But Real Madrid, we know what they can do quickly. They have a good financial position. They've, they've managed the finances during the pandemic really, really well. They do have Gareth Bale's contract you got to deal with. Um, they have a few situations like that that are tricky. They've got to handle. But with where things stand, I, I don't think Real Madrid is looking in the rear view at Barcelona with their issues, with Villarreal, maybe Sevilla a little bit, 
Real Sociedad, Real Madrid should be fine. But they're looking up at Atleti, who they're not used to being in that position. How drastic of an overhaul, John, do you think Real Madrid needs to do going into next season? Needs? I don't, you know, I just think it, I don't see it as drastic. I just, a couple of pieces here and there, you know, shedding some age and some payroll, but I don't see that as drastic. I really don't. Jarrett, what about you? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> without Barcelona there, it's one of those things of like, how much do you need to like risk? Do you, how close do you think you are? If you look, if you're Real Madrid, you look at yourself in the mirror. How close do you think you are? Like, you got to be honest with yourself about this because your biggest competitor is kind of out of the fight for a couple of years while they sort through all their problems. You know, they'll still be there. They will might jump up and bite some people. But, you know, Barcelona isn't the Barcelona we've known for the last 15 years. So be honest with yourself. If you're Real Madrid, like, how much do you want to pour into this? Or can you kind of, I don't want to say coast because I don't like the connotation that comes with it. Can you kind of take the foot off the gas a little bit and see if you can and see if you can compete while also kind of you know clearing your books up a bit and making things easier for yourself in the future so you don't end up in a situation like Barcelona's in? It's a weird time, and I think there's some some tough decisions that that they have to make. Um, Sergio Ramos is one because he's the heart and soul of that team. If you move on from him, that's a big risk. They've talked about Mbappe for so long. It's going to be very expensive. Are they going to be able to pull that off? They've got to get Bale's contract off their books in some form or fashion uh, without buying him out, if that's possible. And I don't know if that's going to be possible. Uh, You're going to be moving on from Marcelo, who's not playing a ton this year. Uh, You re-upped with Luka Modric, who's, who's playing really, really well, but he's 35. You know, how much longer does he have? Yeah, where's that cliff? I it's thought he'd already hit it, close. but man, he pulled himself back. Um, Benzema's thirty-three. You know, Kroos is thirty-one. There was talk about him going, but he's had a very good season. Benzema feels like he's thirty-eight in my head. Like yeah. the fact that he's still yeah. thirty-three is somehow amazing. Mm-hmm. I feel like he was thirty years old during the twenty fourteen World Cup. Like in my head, he was thirty years old at that point. You've got to get younger with your top players. I mean. Your four best players per rating by Sofa score this season in La Liga are four of your oldest players. Kroos, Benzema, Ramos, Modric. You've got to get younger. I I think what's hard about this, and most clubs I would agree with John, like, okay, you're not looking at a dramatic change here. Real Madrid's not most clubs. They don't accept being in a well we're really close we're in second you know we we can we'll be okay we can handle that uh uh-uh. <laughs> they don't they don't do that at, at real madrid it is we're going to win everything and if we're not winning everything we're going to do what we have to do to win everything right i think they do go pretty bold here um the the ramos one's the hardest decision because if you get it wrong you're in a you're going to be in a really bad spot, and it's the intangibles about getting it wrong, right? Because you can't quantify what happens with taking him out of that locker room. When you're looking at Sergio Ramos being part of your negotiations about taking a pay cut, you know his importance in the locker room. Can you remove that? And who? fills into that role. You know, Modric is going to be there, but he's not he's he's not Sergio Ramos. He's not going to all of a sudden become Sergio Ramos in that locker room. I don't know who would. And we've seen the effect of Ramos. We've seen it. I think you need to keep him. I think you need to re up with him for two years. And you need to keep the armband on him. And you need to to have that conversation with him is we're going to re up with you for two years. Yeah, we would have liked to have saved a little bit of money on this, but we can't do that right now because you're that important. But here's what we need from you. And and that's going to be critical because they've got to get a younger center back to be the the heir apparent. I don't know what they have coming through. If they have one, it doesn't seem like they do. 
They, they've got to get better at outside back. They've got to get another goal scorer. I think they do have to go after Mbappe. Uh, I think they have to go after that as the face of the next Real Madrid because, I mean, I think a lot of people thought that would be Odegaard. I, he's not even going to be there, it doesn't look like. Yeah, he, he wants, wants out. out. Well, yeah, I saw he, Arsenal was linked. He's not rated. Him they, 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 don't, they don't rate him. So, you know, he hasn't turned into what people thought he would. I think we're still expecting him to be that breakout star. He's, what, 22 now. You know, I mean, if yeah. he's not that guy, he's not that guy. Vinicius is, is good, but he's not that guy. They need to go get that guy. And, and Mbappe is that guy. I mean, uh, there, there's, I don't think any disputing. Like, it's not Odegaard. It's not Vinicius when they came to Real Madrid. You go get Mbappe right now. He is that guy. Yeah. And whatever they have to do to make that happen, I, I think that is the move, along with keeping Sergio Ramos as the captain because you need that stability. While you then look at, okay, who's going to replace Benzema long-term? Who's going to replace Luka Modric long-term? Who's going to replace Marcelo? Who's going to replace Tony Kroos? Who's going to replace these guys? But you need Ramos to be a bridge, and you, go, you need to go get that face of the team going forward. The biggest question, and I don't have the answer, is at coach. Yeah. Um, is Zidane the guy to, to be there and do this? Or do you need to go get somebody else? Uh, but who would that somebody be Tuchel? is the question. No, they wouldn't go for Tuchel because they're not going to bring in somebody who's going to fight with the board. That, that would not play. They, they did that with Jose, and they didn't like it, and they choked on it. Uh, but they had to because Barcelona was just running away with everything. They, they got away from their principles in getting somebody like Jose, and they didn't like it. They, they won't do that again. Tuchel is not Jose Mourinho, but they're not going to bring him in to fight with them all the time. Max Allegri would make some sense there. I could absolutely see that one. Uh, Pochettino would have, but he's, he's not going to be available. Um, I, Allegri feels like the one for me at, at Real Madrid, if, unless you decide, you know what? We think Zidane would be better for us than Allegri, and that's the direction we're going to go. I don't think it's Tuchel, though. I, I do not think it's Thomas Tuchel at Real Madrid. Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, Pochettino. Pochettino uh, was in an article, mentioned an article yesterday where he said that they're going to try to keep uh, Mbappe long term, keep Mbappe and Neymar. And so th- you have all of these. The, the Real Madrid versus PSG element in all of this, it's like PSG, they, I mean, PSG wants to hang on to Mbappe. Real Madrid is going to be chasing after Mbappe. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, that interesting pull for me. PSG is not getting Messi and keeping Mbappe. They can't. No. So, it, no. if the decision comes down to it, they're going to get Messi. Yeah. So, of course, Pochettino is going to say that because Mbappe is there right now and playing for him. Right. That, that's coach speak. We know that. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's translate it for what it is. They're going to go after Messi. It, it's to the point that, that Barcelona folks are like, hey, could you guys shut up, please? We're, we're, we're tired of hearing about you talking about our player. They're going to go after Lionel Messi. And if they get him, then they can't pay Mbappe and Neymar and Messi. Mbappe oh. would be the odd man out because it sounds like they want to keep Neymar, and I think Messi would want them to keep Neymar. That right. would open up the door for Real Madrid. Real Madrid needs to kick the door open and, and get him. And then if PSG doesn't get Messi, then PSG's in a whole different situation. And then they start to have some conversations. It's, it's going to be fascinating how all that plays out because there are a lot of interconnected parts with the Messi move that will affect Manchester City, that will affect PSG, that will obviously affect Barcelona, will by domino effect of Real Madrid of maybe Chelsea. You know, there's going to be other clubs that will be affected by other moves that could happen because let's say Real Madrid doesn't, they can't go get Mbappe. It doesn't work out for them. Let's say he goes to Manchester City and PSG keeps him. Well, then I would expect that Real Madrid's number two would be let's go pay whatever we have to to get Erling Haaland. And you go get Erling Haaland as your new face, and you, he is your long-term replacement for Benzema, and maybe you find a way to play both of them for a year. Okay, fine, you do that. That will affect Chelsea, because Chelsea is reportedly going to go after Haaland this year and skip the release clause year. They're going to go ahead and pay more. That's what they're saying. So then that's going to affect them. This is going to get really odd and weird. And then you've got the coaching issues with it, because 
you know, is Frank Lampard going to be the one to make that decision? Right now, I think you'd say no. That would probably mean Tuchel would go to Chelsea. Potentially, it could mean Allegri. If Allegri goes there, then I think it's far more likely that Zidane would stay in Madrid because I don't see them going for Tuchel. Right. So it, it, you get all these dominoes that get affected, and it gets really interesting. That's not even bringing up Mo Salah and his situation, which doesn't sound like it's all copacetic at Liverpool, no matter no. what they say after I the I forgot effect. that was still happening. It's still there. I mean, he wants a new deal. That he hasn't gotten one that he wants, and he's been whispering and talking and saying, and, and Klopp's had to say things. So what if, what if he goes to Real Madrid? What if he's option three? What if they don't get Holland? What if they don't get... Mbappe, what do they say? Okay, we'll just go get Mo Salah. Then Liverpool's got to replace him. It gets wild. Like, that carousel, those musical chairs get really, really, really interesting. But Real Madrid, I don't think we'll sit quietly and expect this to sort itself out. I think in the offseason, they're going to have to go bold and start that process of the new Real Madrid. Just how new is it? I don't know if they're going to get to to do everything they want to do because there's a lot of dominoes that will affect it. Speaking of musical chairs, let's go to England and the Premier League. I want to get y'all's take on what happened in the first game yesterday. Manchester City wins. They go into the top spot for a few hours. But the opening goal created a lot of issues, and it led to Aston Villa's manager being sent off for his complaints about it. Uh, Dean Smith, not happy about it. You had a situation where Rodri is coming back from an offside position and Tyrone Mings makes a play on the ball. Rodri dispossesses him. They go in. It comes down to an interpretation of Law 11, the offside law. And I think it falls in the same category of the interpretations that we've talked about with the whole idea of obvious action and clearly impacting the uh, ability of an opponent to play the ball and goalkeepers having to deal with a player who is in an offside position. They think he's in an offside position. In this case, you probably knew, but you're not 100% sure if you're Tyrone Mings, that a player is behind you in an offside position. You have to do something knowing that player is there, but the way referees interpret the law, they don't think he's an active participant. But Tyrone Mings is not going to play that ball or play it in the way that he did if there's nobody behind him. Right. Like, it it does have an effect. And by the letter of the law, sure, if you're a lawyer, you can take the, the laws of the game, you can take what happened here, and you can explain it. I understand that. I think you're interpreting it wrong and you're losing the spirit of the laws of the game. He does interfere with the play. He did make an obvious action because, in my opinion, he's coming back to where the ball's being played. Yep. That's an obvious action for me. No, he didn't challenge for it, but he is coming up from behind the player. He's moving towards the ball from an offside position. I think the second part that everybody's jumped in on to try to justify it doesn't even apply for me because... Yeah, it's an obvious play on the ball. Tyrone Mings makes a play. He's bringing it down. He's trying to control it. But then a player who came from an offside position takes it away from him. That shouldn't be allowed. That doesn't no. feel right. No. Jared, did you, I mean, did you see this? Have you, what, what's your interpretation of this? Yeah, I mean, I saw it. It was, um, it's, it's one of those, again, like you said, it's, it's a matter of just interpretation because there's not like a clear... I think I think you're taking into a lot of it an assumption. Like does does Mings know he's there? Does he not play the ball if he's not there? Does he is he thinking, Am I the last guy back? Am I not the last guy back? Um, you know, is there someone behind me that's keeping him on side for a free running goal because they're slow getting back? Like there's a lot of assumptions associated with all that. Um that we get to the idea of, you know, as we've seen this in Atlanta uh, a couple of years ago, the goal that got called back because a defender played the ball or didn't play the ball. And then it fell, I think, Joseph or Miguel, and they shot. They got wiped away. They, um, the way that one went down, the defender blocked a pass, uh, blocked a ball, and they did it intentionally. But the justification for calling the – because they called the goal back, so it went the opposite yeah. way. 
they said that the, it was called back because it wasn't an intentional play on the ball. It was it deflected which, off which of them. Which was very wrong. Which but. was incorrect, but a justification for the call. And that that's that's what I keep coming back to, Jared, is like it's, referees can justify this any which way they want. That doesn't make it right. I guess the way I see it is, did the ball find you or did you go find the ball if you're the defender? Like, is the ball finding you and there's nothing you can do about it? Or are you making action towards the ball? Like, if it ricochets off you because you happen to be there and you're not paying attention, that's one thing. If the ball's in your vicinity and you're stepping towards it, you're making a motion with your body as we get into the idea of, like, did you make a football move after you caught the ball? Did you make a soccer move after you saw the ball in your vicinity? That's really hard to interpret. Um, I... Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it's the more I watched it, the, the more I watched it, and then watched the slow motion. I was like, I mean, he 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 plays the ball, whether or not he knows, you know, the guys on his back and could take it from him. Um, I think if you wanted to be the devil's advocate, you could say, hey, instead of bringing that ball down and trying to control it, maybe put your neck into it and put it twenty yards away. It's the player it is change the principle of it. I'm just saying. Yeah, the players gaining an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the the issue I have with it. They're gaining an advantage which is not supposed to be allowed, but there's too much wiggle room in the way the law's written. That needs to be cleaned up because this is it's a different version of it, but it's similar to what we talked about with the Caden Clark goal for the Red Bulls uh, um against Atlanta United. It's similar to, uh, I know it was Munch and Gladbach in the Champions League and a situation that was ruled the other way with a, a player that was not in the line of sight. I mean, the line of sight thing is, I think it gets over amplified in this conversation. He's in, an, in this situation. It's a player who affects the play from being in an offside position. You can be, and I think everybody understands this, so we're not going to harp on it. You can be in an offside position and not, not commit an offside offense. That I think most people understand. It's not just automatic if you're standing in an offside position. Okay. It's do you affect the play? Do you gain an advantage from being in an offside position? position do you become involved in active play I feel like in this case Rodri becomes involved in active play coming back from an offside position by getting involved in challenging Mings but he's also moving towards the ball even at the beginning of it on the header you know he's moving towards the ball so he's involved in active play the idea of active play I think is too narrow in the interpretation it's not defined and I agree with what Thomas Jewin's saying in the, the chat. He's saying this is consistently how it's interpreted. I think the interpretation's wrong. And that's what I said on the Caden Clark issue. It's what we talked about with the, the one with Munch and Gladbach, how it was interpreted differently. It needs to be defined. That's the issue for me. Um, it, it, that just doesn't feel like that's the spirit of the laws of the game. What happened yesterday? Here's what the here's what the PG uh, MOL uh, statement explained that once Mings had deliberately controlled the ball, the following law applied: "Quote, a player in an offside position receiving the ball from an opponent who deliberately plays the ball, including by deliberate handball, is not considered to have gained an advantage unless it was a deliberate a deliberate save by any opponent." See, I don't care about that. That that's and that's my issue with that interpretation. You're picking what you want to justify the call. It shouldn't have gotten to that point because the ball is being played by a Manchester City player on the header towards a player who is in an offside position who is moving towards the ball. Mm -hmm. That, in my opinion, in my interpretation, is becoming involved in active play. The, the offside law, a player in an offside position at the moment the ball is played or touched by a teammate is only penalized on becoming involved in active play by, and this is where you get into interfering with play by playing or touching a ball, passed or touched by a teammate. No, he didn't do that. 
interfering with an opponent by preventing an opponent from being from playing or being able to play the ball by clearly obstructing the line of vision. No, challenging an opponent for the ball after he after it was played. Yes, and their argument is well, he didn't challenge on the ball in the air, so he's okay. Yeah, that feels like a stretch. Mm. Yeah. Um, clearly attempting to play a ball which is close when this action impacts on an opponent. You can argue it's not close here. Making an obvious action which clearly impacts on the ability of an opponent to play the ball. I think it's an obvious action by running towards the ball mm-hmm. in this case. Yeah. I think it affects the play. And it's, it just, it's all down to interpretation. And again, you can skip that part of it and say, okay, well, we're, he wasn't involved in the active play, and then when the defender played it, then it's fair game. I don't think that's how the, the laws were intended to be interpreted. It feels like looking for something that maybe wasn't the idea of it. IFAB needs to clean this up. This has come up multiple times in the last year. IFAB's meeting in March, they need to clean up the language around this. Offside needs to be easier to understand in the situation because... That felt like a clear offside to me. But sure, yeah. you can justify that it wasn't called. You, you can absolutely create the argument. I think it's wrong. I just think it's the wrong interpretation. Yeah. Uh, so the law deems Rodri had not gained an advantage allowed to play on. I thought, I thought he'd gained an advantage, especially coming back and playing the ball as Mings is trying to figure out what he wants to do with it. I thought that Rodri was engaged. No, I, and I can understand the argument of that because he's not playing the ball immediately. He's playing it after it, it's played by Mings, which, again, feels like a stretch. Thomas Jewin, it, it, well, first was mad that I uh, I insulted lawyers. I, I'm sorry, Thomas. I'm not insulting all lawyers. <laughs> just I said lawyers can argue however they want because this is very open-ended, and they will, and they have. And yes. Thomas is saying that it seems like it's a situation of always interpret the rule in favor of the attacker. Not always, because we did see the situation with the, the, the Mönchengladbach Gladbach goal being brought back. But typically, yes. I think the idea of that was in the old days of tie goes to the attacker in terms of the, you know, looking at it as an AR. If it's really close, give it to the attacker. Now you can you can see things differently. And this is different to me. This isn't even that because this is a very different situation. This should not be ruled in that area. And in my opinion, this is my opinion. I know there's referees who will disagree. Obviously the, the PGMOL will disagree with it. Uh, There are people who will agree. It's an interpretation, but that's the problem is it's too open to interpretation and it doesn't feel like it hits the, the spirit of the offside law here. Because if then, just like we talked about with the Caden Clark goal, if I'm going to teach my team then, is I'm going to say, stand in an offside position. Hang out in an offside position, because if you're not in the line of sight, make sure you're not in the line of sight on a shot. But if you're in an offside position, you're obviously going to impact the goalkeeper because they know you're there. Yeah. They don't know if you're offside because they don't have that view, but they know you're there and you're going to impact them. You're going to distract them. In this case, hang out in an offside position on these plays because if the defender has a bad touch, then cool, you can benefit from it. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we, that's not what we want, I don't think. It's no. just, I don't think it's what we want in the law. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing is it's an interpretation and people will interpret it differently. I agree with Dean Smith here. I think it was a, a poor interpretation. What do you think, Jared? It's philosophy. Um, there's a point in which uh, when you're arguing it, you don't necessarily have to be right. You just have to prove you're not wrong in some aspect. And it's one of those that I think it was it was open enough to interpretation because of the way it was played that I understood why they did it. You know, I'd like it, but I understood why they called it what it did, and I understood why Dean Smith was upset, and I understand why... Um, you know why city's happy the goal stood because on um, both sides can make strong arguments one way or another. It's just because the way the rule is kind of so fluid where there's so much wiggle room on either side of that needle. It doesn't hold rigid really, but that's, that's just one of those rules that it's, it's going to be applied. Uh, it's it's, it's going to depend on who's, who's refereeing that day. You give these, you know, philosophical rules. Sometimes it's going to be coming down to who's in charge that day. How do they see that rule? Um, 
you know, how much are they willing to let go? What do they deem as being, you know, a play on the ball? What do they deem as being, um, you know, impacting the play as an offside player? And then you've got guys who float offside who, um, who we've seen this before, where a guy will just kind of, he'll kind of wander offside and he'll kind of just slowly walk back. He won't hustle back. He'll, he'll just slowly walk back. And, you know, we've seen it. We've seen it with Joseph where, you know, Ico Parra plays, you know, Atlanta, try, I think if Atlanta was clearing a ball, Ico Parra play, try, tries to play it, ends up just chipping it right back to Joseph who gets in on goal. Where you take your time coming back from an offside position, sometimes, you know, fortune favors the lazy. And that's a fluke incident, and it can happen. In this instance, it could be a matter of, you know, fortune fortune favors those who kind of push the limits. And you're you're making the official make the call. And as a from a player's perspective, I don't have a problem with that. I think I'm, I'm fine with the idea of you push the limits and you make the official make the call in those situations. It's the same thing with Atlanta generating a ton of penalties a couple of years ago where you know they led the league in penalties. I think they were second or third in the league in 2019 in penalties. You're creating so much activity and you're doing so much and you're taking chances. You're creating opportunities where you're forcing the defender to make a decision and you're forcing the official to to make a decision and make a potentially big decision. And if you're going to be offside and you're attacking a defender like that, you're forcing him to make a decision and you're forcing the official to make a decision. If it goes against you, oh well. If it doesn't, look what it can get you. And then it does become down to to what the what the interpretation of the rule is. Because that's going to have to be changed. And no matter how you change it, guys are going to find ways to kind of push that envelope as much as they can to find the bits of advantage they can and what they can get away with. A couple of things. Um, the the reference to the Joseph Ico Parra one, um, very different. Still one mind. of the funniest goals ever. No, it's hilarious, but. but it's very different in my mind because, and I'll, I'll, I'll break down why, and I think this explains why I don't like the decision yesterday. You go back and you look at the two of them. Yesterday, the header is going on a straight line towards Rodri. It doesn't get to him, but it's going on a straight line towards him. On the Joseph Opara situation, it's a clearance from LGP, and it's not going towards Joseph. He's off to the side behind Opara coming back from an offside position. Then Opara plays him in. That's, that's completely different in my mind. It's not the same situation. Because Opara gave him the opportunity. In this case, Rodri's coming back from an offside position and takes it off of Mings. Yeah. It's, it's different. Mings didn't do anything wrong except get dispossessed by a player coming back from an offside position. And chesting it down, I don't think, is full control. So I don't think the ball's under control by him yet, and a player benefited from coming back from an offside position. We see a lot of times that idea about players coming back from an offside position, flag goes up. This case, it doesn't. I, I don't like the interpretation here, because the ball's being played in his direction. He is coming back to the ball, and then he dispossesses a player who brings it down. He gained an advantage. The Joseph one, he was handed an advantage, by Ico Parra, who misplayed a ball, completely got it wrong. I think they're two different things. It needs to be cleaned up. It need, it, that's, that's, I guess, my biggest thing with the offside law, and it, it's been that way since we had VAR. This is not necessarily a VAR situation. It's not the, the lines on the field. It's not interpretation in that way where you're using technology to interpret it, and it is or it isn't. Now, though, you can see everything so much more clearly. You're not relying on just the heat of the moment. You can go back and look at it like you did with the Caden Clark goal. And you can say, yes, it didn't, or at least I can say it. Some of you disagreed. You can say that he's not in the line of sight, but he is impacting on the goalkeeper's ability to play the ball. In this case, he's not in the line of sight of Tyrone Mings, but he comes back and he gains that advantage. I think he is a part of the active play. So I don't yeah. care about the part about the intentional play for Mings. Everybody's going to step two. I'm on step one. The ball is played in his direction. He is coming towards the ball. He impacts Mings. Yeah. And that should be offside, in my opinion. It's an interpretation. IFAB needs to figure out how they want it interpreted. The lack of consistency can be a problem. This felt like an offside decision to me. 
we'll have to wait and see how they how yeah. they change it going forward. Yeah, Bart uh, Bartimus Prime's in, and he says, "My advice to any young player regarding many laws of the game: force the referee to make a call in these situations. Yep. But but then you have to understand you put the referee in a situation to make that call. Yeah, yeah I mean, watch the limit. That's it. And if, and if he rules it against you, oh well, you ain't cheating, you ain't trying." It's true. It's it, it need IFAB needs to look at these things and, and clean it up. The referee associations around the world need to look at it, clean it up, decide how they want to interpret them so we get some consistency. This one felt different. I understand the frustration from Aston Villa. I did it decide the game. It was the opening goal. Um, it obviously had an impact. It, it was late. It was the seventy ninth minute. Villa had had played very well in frustrating Manchester City. It did change the game. Yeah. Um, was Manchester City the better team? Yes. Villa sat back and defended and defended and defended and defended. It it, it was a huge moment. I, I don't know if Manchester City finds a breakthrough if this doesn't happen. There's there's no way for us to truly know that. And that's what makes this really hard. And it does have an impact on the title race because it put Manchester City into the lead for a little while. Fulham made Manchester City feel even better with an early goal in the fifth minute against Manchester United. Edinson Cavani pulled it back 15 minutes later. And then Paul Pogba with the winners, a beautiful goal from him in the 65th. Fulham was doing what Fulham does. I mean, you go back and you look at the Pogba goal. I don't know how he gets the space to put that shot on goal when there are 10 Fulham players within 35 yards of their own goal. And he still found space. Yeah. And it's a great goal from him, and it's enough to, to get the job done for Manchester United. So we go to the table, and Liverpool plays today. They have a chance to make up some ground. They host Burnley. Intrigued to see if Liverpool can find some goals. They have really struggled on the goal-scoring front as of late. But right now, Manchester United has a two-point lead. Manchester City has a game in hand. Leicester's on the same number of games, also on 38 points. Liverpool in fourth with a game in hand that's going to be played today on Manchester United. They are six points back. They could cut that to three by the end of the day. Tottenham has a game in hand. They're on 33 then it's Everton and West Ham on 32. That's everybody over 30 points within 10 points of the lead. Has anything changed for you guys? I know, Jarrett, we're, we're about to get Kevin Egan on here in just a minute, so this is probably your last yeah, question. Yeah, you're about to lose me anyway. Okay, your last question. Has anything changed? You've got seven teams within eight points of the title in, in England right now. How many teams have a legit opportunity to win the league? Uh, in my mind, I've got four teams. I've got Liverpool, City, United, and Leicester. No but Tottenham, I, no Everton, yeah. no West Ham. Uh, no. Okay. No, not, to say, not to say that they can't, but those are the four that I'm looking at as the teams that I think will rise to the occasion when the time comes. Then midway uh, through, who are you also, calling? Uh, who, who's winning it? Uh, I think City. I think City is that gif of Big Bird kicking down your front door of your apartment on a darkened night. Um, yeah, I think City's just gonna. <laughs> City's just kind of inevitable about this, where everybody wanted to write them off, and you can't. You just can't. Also, I'm gonna light a match and leave on this note that uh, MLS just posted a letter from uh, Don Garber about negotiations. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Good times, Jarrett. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out, Jarrett. Um, before we get to that, uh, John. Title contenders, you got seven within eight points. Um, one thing for sure on, on Everton to keep in mind is they have two games in hand on Manchester United, and they're eight points back. Is it a four-horse race? Is it fewer? Is it more? I have five, including Tottenham. Uh, where Everton is concerned, I don't know if Dominic Calvert-Lewin can keep his pace offensively. Uh, Hamas has been in and out with injuries. So Everton for me is a concern West Ham. I just don't think they have the, the firepower to compete uh, in the overall. I think that Tottenham, when you have Son and Kane, you can't just dismiss that and they can, you know, outscore folks. I know that, uh, defensively there are some issues for, uh, Tottenham for me, even though they've only given up 17 in play. I think that also you're dealing with European competition with Tottenham. 
Liverpool, I think, will be in the discussion. Leicester, we talked about yesterday having a secondary score for Jamie Vardy because we know that everyone's going to be marking him. Is it Barnes? Is it Tielemans? Is it Madison? Who helps out Jamie Vardy? Uh, Manchester United, for me, they're going to be a part of the discussion. Obviously, with Manchester City, they have to look at the injury possibilities of De Bruyne and Kyle Walker, although some folks would sit there and say that not having Kyle Walker would actually be a plus for the defense right now. But De Bruyne, if he's injured, uh, that could put a, a wrench into things. So I'll go four and a half to five if to include Tottenham on the full. I, I don't want to rule Everton out yet because they've got some – some possibilities here with their next Premier League game is and two matches in hand. Yeah, though well, they got the two games in hand, but they play teams that are right there with them, so they can make noise quickly. They host Leicester on the twenty seventh. They then host Newcastle, where they can pick up points. They go to Leeds, which will be tricky, but they should win that. They go to Manchester United, which will be very difficult. They host Fulham, which they should win. They go to Liverpool, which will be very difficult. They host Southampton. They go to Chelsea. Then they get Burnley and West Brom late in March. And Crystal Palace, three in a row there, where they can make up, make up some ground again. They've got to pull results. Maybe not against all of them, but they've got to pull results against some of Leicester, Manchester United, Liverpool. Right. They they have to pull three points out of those three at a minimum to hang yeah. around and then clean up on the, the lesser lights that they'll be playing and not slip up against your Southampton and Chelsea's and the team and Leeds. So it it's possible for Everton, but it's it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky. It's possible. Um okay. We gotta get a couple of things going before we get Kevin on at ten. So John, we're gonna go just a little bit early. You guys can get your scorecards out and get ready for John to tell us about our good friend over in Decatur, Mr. Steve Apolinski. Apolinski and Associates LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH Network. For wrongful death and serious injury matters, one place that you need to go, and it is that particular firm, Apolinski and Associates LLC. You can do it three different ways. You can get a free consultation by picking up the phone, giving them a call, 404-377-9191. You can shoot Steve an email directly, steve at aa-legal.com, and he'll respond to you in kind. Or you can go on the World Wide Web, large device or small. Type in aa-legal.com, hit the enter key, hit the return key, hit the arrow, whatever advances you to the Apolinsky & Associates LLC homepage. And you can get your questions answered when a pop-up window pops up, low right-hand corner, because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Thank you, Chris Hutchison, to get your questions answered in any of those three ways, phone, email, web. Over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for clients in Georgia and Alabama for wrongful death and serious injury matters recognized as legally by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia for wrongful death and serious injury matters, one place that you need to go, and it's Apolinsky and Associates, LLC. The website is aa-legal.com. You are even faster today. Damn. Yeah, you are even faster today. That was the was, fastest that you have I done. Was not, I was not aware of this. Yeah, that was by far the fastest. Um. All right, let's see what people have to say. Uh, too fast today, 4.6. Uh, a little fast, but wow, impressive. Um, a little fast, but solid 7. 8.7, very nice. Uh, fast, but smooth, 8.2. Um, 7, clear, decent enough. Fast, but solid read, 8.2. I think this is your best performance of all time, John. Wow. Um, Domer, he was going so fast, I I couldn't keep up with adjusting the music. It, it was so fast. Uh, Sharif, better than past couple of days. Eight. Domer, seven point nine. Man, that that's that's your best score ever. Okay, cool. Uh, six gear says if you went a little bit slower, it would have been a nine plus. Oh wow. No, it was really good. Uh, I don't I don't think there were any problems with it. It was just fast. It was faster than normal. That was all. Okay. That's not that was... bad. That, it was just fast. I was just not aware that it was fast. The one of the fastest ones. I've oh, ever it was done. the fastest. There's no question about that. It was definitely okay. the fastest. Um, okay. Before we get Kevin on the letter that Jarrett referenced, that uh, Thomas Jewin thought that I would go ranting on um, from Don Garber. It is basically 
this is the start of the 2021 season today with the Super Draft, which is typical. Yep. Um, the Super Draft used to take place at the United Soccer Coaches Convention. It was always a big part of it. I enjoyed going to it when I went to the convention. Um, I'll always remember the uh, fire picking Jack Harrison, which caught people by surprise, and then trading him to New York City and all of the, the craziness on the floor with, with everybody catching up with that. Um, I guess the biggest thing that people are going to jump on here in the letter, I mean, a lot of it is not a surprise. Um, yeah. Talked about it being the most remarkable year in their 25 seasons, appreciating everything that the players, staffs, officials, ownership did to get through 2020. Um, talking about launching the new season, coming out of the pandemic in the strongest possible position. We'll continue to require everyone in MLS to work together really driving that home, and then they talk about the situation with the MLSPA. They said, as we look ahead to a second tough season this year, we met with the MLS Players Association and their player representatives in early January to talk about how we can deal with the ongoing challenges with the pandemic and the impact on MLS for a second year. The MLS ownership group presented a fair proposal to a very difficult situation, and we know the terms of that. 100% of the salaries this year, a two-year extension of the CBA. That's the, the solution has been presented. Um, they, and this is from Don Garber's letter. We presented our proposal to the MLSPA two weeks ago and look forward to receiving a response. That was also reported by uh, The Athletic as well, that there has not been a response yet. Bob Foose last week talked about the process, I think, of determining that response. And that was last week. Um. It shouldn't be like this. It really shouldn't. It just shouldn't. I I, I understand the the players don't want to give anything back here, um, but it shouldn't be where you're not getting a response. I mean, it's been it's been two plus weeks. Uh, there's no real excuse for it. Uh, Garber said we're ready to meet with the MLSPA and players in the coming days and reach an agreement that works for the short and long term benefit to all. They all have to get on the Zoom call and and sort through this and get it done. This. None of this stuff is helping. I don't know what else the league's supposed to do when they present a proposal and they don't get a response. I don't like the back and forth publicly at all. I don't like the posturing. I don't even know if this is posturing. Like I, I don't know what else is supposed to do. Um, you submit a proposal. You're following the protocols in the CBA that you negotiated last year. Be a good partner and give a response, even if it's to say, no, we don't want to do that. Let's, yeah. let's, let's go up with something next. I mean, it's just lingering on. It's not helping. So, I don't know. I, I don't know if you gain anything from putting it out there like this. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it pushes a response. I don't know if it angers people. None of it's helping. None of the situation is helping, though. And it's frustrating. So, with that, we're going to talk about how the season is starting today and the Super Draft side of things. We're going to get Kevin Egan on the line. If Mateo can get that done for us. Kevin is doing the draft recap show with me for Atlanta United. That'll come out tonight on Atlanta United social media channels. As Mateo works it, gets Kevin on the line. What's going on, Kevin? How are you? Good morning, guys. How are we? Doing good. Getting ready for draft day. Yeah, yeah, my, myself included. I'm looking forward to working with you today, Jason. We're, I'm sure you filled everybody in doing a show from Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Not too sure when the show will drop later this evening. Um, we don't know what's going to happen that? today. That, that's what's wild about this. Like, this is the first time we've done a, a draft show. And, you know, Atlanta United's typically picked late. And, and there's not a lot of intrigue about picking at the end of the first round. Now you're picking five. Like, you could pick a player that you could see next year see minutes mm -hmm. that could happen you could trade down if there's not a player at five that you want or there's a player that somebody else wants more you could trade out and get allocation money and then you're looking at those later picks as maybe somebody that comes into atlanta united too like it could go so many different directions i think there's three like reputable mock drafts out there and there's three different picks for atlanta united and all in the same position too by the way so i, I have no <laughs> idea where this goes what position are the mock drafts picking? All center back. Everybody's looking at center back, which is, I think, the position that's deepest in the draft. But they're looking at three different players for Atlanta United at center back. And none of them, I think, are really related to players going ahead of it. 
You've got the player from Kentucky, the 6'6", 215 mm-hmm. center back, um, which would be wild. Atlanta United has never had anybody with that kind of size. Uh, New Hampshire, Josh Bauer, has been predicted to going to Atlanta United yeah. and going high. And then a player that, that I like, uh, Nabi Kibanguchi from UC Davis, who's a wild card because he's coming from a smaller program. Yeah, that's who Travis Clark has in his uh, projection. I, I'm looking at Travis Clark's, for example, who's all over this each and every year. And he has Daniel Pereira going all the way to 12. Ooh, I, I know you like, like Pereira. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. It, it was instant. You know the eye test when you see a player yeah. and you just say to yourself, he's, he's a baller. He's an absolute baller. Daniel Pereira, you, know, you and I were talking briefly about it yesterday. I had a chance to cover a few of his games when he played for VA Tech this season. And uh, phenomenal in his freshman year as well. But, but when I saw him play, he has this, he has this um, ability that you pick up nearly on the street where no matter who's near you, uh, Jack Grealish has the same thing for Villa. Da- Darlington Nagby has the same thing. Had it for, for Atlanta and Portland and now for Columbus. In that, No matter who's near you, you, you've got enough balance. You've got enough technique to get away. Um, and, and he could be that player in Major League Soccer. He, he, he plays, he wears the nine uh, for, for VA Tech or wore the nine. And it's a little bit deceptive because he can play as an all-action midfielder. Um, a really smart ball player. He'd be my number one, honestly. I really like Mayaka as well. I really like Calvin Harris. Um, but, but in terms of... Well, Calvin Harris is not what Atlanta would need, for example. No, right. Calvin Harris is, is, is a really talented winger who can play as a striker as well. Look, can shoot from distance, but is also very technical. And then Mayaka is just this guy who ties it all together beautifully. Like He's everywhere. He covers every single blade of grass. And he's very tidy. But I just think... Daniel Pereira has this X factor. Like, like he, he, he I, I always look for stories as well, Jason. You and I were touching on it briefly yesterday. His, his family that sought asylum five years ago, back in 2015. Him going to school in Virginia, not speaking any English. Uh, his, he was a baseball player growing up. You know, he, he's, his parents like worked extremely hard when they were over. His mother, in an interview recently, was like quick to point out, like we, we came over on holiday visa, but we were straight in paying taxes. And we, you know, she she wanted to reassure everybody that they're doing everything possible um, to do it to do it, quote unquote, right. Which I just think his story is beautiful, and he's he's jumped in beautifully at uh, at VA Tech under Mike Brisendine, and he, he's a baller. So if he drops to five, if I'm if I'm Carlos Bocanegra and Paul McDonough, I grab him. I, I grab agree. him because I think he's got that X factor to go all the way and be a top player to one day represent Venezuela. You know, Kevin, one of the things for me that uh, I always enjoy about draft day is that when I was growing up, when I was a kid back in the late 1890s, <laughs> it, was, it, was always, it was always the big name schools that you were looking to and you were gravitating toward for all of your information and all of your talent on draft days. Now, two of the guys that Jason mentions that are possibilities at center back are New Hampshire in Josh Bauer and Kibben Gucci from UC Davis. So it's nowadays, if you're talented, regardless of where you're playing your ball, folks will find you. It's not I just so. all of, all of the, those big name schools that are out there now. It's New Hampshire's, it's Cal Davis's, it's Akron's, it's all of these other schools that are out there that are a part of these discussions now. And that to me is just one of the coolness factors that I have on a day like this. Of course, absolutely. And, you know, often it's regional too. Like you'll see clubs that won't exactly be scouting out too much out in California if you're based in Columbus. You'll be honing in on your Indiana, for example, or your Ohio State and, and uh you, you know, I remember when I was when I was working at the Chicago Fire, they picked up Matt Polster from SIU Edwardsville. And that was seen as a little bit bold, given that nobody was really talking about Polster too much. Yet he he had the physique. He had the certain characteristics that would translate well to the professional game. Uh, I, I love this day. I, I really do enjoy it. I love the success stories we've seen over the years. Our, our own legend, say, Michael Parkhurst from Wake Forest, for example. Um, you see... Uh, and Chop Show talking about him and, and his pictures around Wake. And, and we're going to actually speak to Bobby Muse a little bit later on, the coach at Wake Forest. And hope everyone can join us for the show later on. Uh, it's just a wonderful day. And there's so many talented coaches out there. There's so many brilliant programs. There's so many class ball players that 
you are better served sometimes playing a few extra years in college to prepare themselves for the professional game because these games come thick and fast in the college season. This season's been a little weird. You know, there's been tournaments, it's been broken up. Um, and I wonder how that will affect the draft. I don't know if it will. Maybe it will. Uh, but I hope to see Daniel Pereira go pretty high and I would love to see him drop to five and I would love to see Atlanta United pick him up. But if they don't, obviously, you know, Carlos and Paul being back at the club now, they have their reasons. Yeah, it seems like everybody is zeroing in on Mayaka to Austin, which I get going number one. Most people have that. They don't have too many midfielders yet either, right? So, so Austin, I think they, they could do with Mayaka. Yeah, they could. I, I think maybe Calvin Harris is a better fit for them. Most people have those guys one, two pretty consistently. I'm with you. If Harris was somehow available at five, I could see Atlanta trading down because I think somebody would want to come up and get him. He wouldn't be as valuable to Atlanta. Pereira's the wild card. I mean, Ivis Galarsep has him at three to, to Houston, which would make a lot of sense. I could absolutely see that. Um, th- it's it's going to be... Again, but again, like this is, this is Jason, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. This is what, what, what uh, John, when you brought up that point, that's what we touched on. Pereira fell on Mike Brizendine's lap. Like yeah. per- Mike Brizendine stumbled upon him because of his past. So he's not someone who came through high school. Like, you know, we, everyone was talking about Andrew Carlton when he was 13. And, 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 you know, Jason, I'm sure you know here in Atlanta, you could probably list off 20 names that were coming through the ranks and everybody seemed to know who they were. And, they, 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 you know, the, the college coaches were all trying to grab them. Not the case with Daniel Pereira at all. He fell on Brizendine's lap. And that's why maybe he'll fall under the radar here a little bit. But the eye test will tell you that this guy's top class. Yeah. Being Generation Adidas, I don't think he'll fall too far. I'd be shocked if he fell to 12. I'd be blown away if he fell to 12. 100%. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Would you, see would you that grab one. him if you were if you were picking a five for Atlanta? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because he he reminds me of Frankie Amaya in, in that he is a central midfielder who can play deeper. He, he can put in the work to be an eight, but he's mm-hmm. an eight who can impact the game in the final third. And, and you don't always find that, you know. And I don't know if Atlanta has a true eight who is that guy. You know, Hindman is more of an attacking guy not so much of the eight the box to box um mo adams is not quite as good going forward into that final third and contributing although he showed a few things this year that surprised me um hosetsu we don't really know where he slots in just yet the the Mm -hmm. issue would be you have a lot of central midfielders but Pereira, you don't have to rush him if you get him you know he's a little bit younger than a lot of guys in this draft you can have him play with Atlanta United too, a good bit. He's Generation Adidas, so he's very cap friendly, very roster friendly. And you can see what you have. And, and he's raw. I think that's the biggest thing is the upside on him might be the biggest of anybody in the draft. Yeah. And as we know too well, the Super Draft can can prove fruitful. You know, like I, 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 I'm going back and forth in my head today. Who was Atlanta United's most successful draft pick? Is it Miles or is it Julian? Obviously, I think you'd put John Gallagher at three, mm-hmm. but I, I'd probably put Julian. And maybe yeah. in time to come, you'll say Miles. Uh, but 15 goals, 35 assists from a guy you picked, what, seven in the draft? Yep. Remarkable. Yep. You can get something out of this five pick for sure if you want. Yeah. Or you can get, I think, a good return in a trade if you want to. What's the worst miss in draft history for you guys? The biggest miss. I mean, you can go back in the day, and I don't know if that's necessarily fair because there have been some number one picks that didn't pan out. Uh, a, a local guy, Jason Moore from Parkview, uh, was yeah. picked by DC United, and and he had a knee injury, and I think DC probably rolled the dice a little bit too much. He had a knee injury at Virginia, and it was too risky. But that you're going back into days where teams didn't have as big of a scouting department. The college game was different. Just your player acquisition was different. Um, I'll tell you the one that I keep coming back to that I think Minnesota United really put themselves behind the eight ball with was Abu Dunladi number one in 2017. They could have had Miles. They, they, they could have had, I mean, nobody was looking at Julian as number one, but you look at the results, Julian's been a better player in the league than Abu Dunladi. Abu Dunladi didn't really give them anything at number one. They really needed a player like Miles. Yeah, no, you're exactly. I I always go back to 2011, and Vancouver picking Omar Salgado yeah. ahead of Nagby. Nagby went to Portland at two, and Omar Salgado, you know, Omar Omar Salgado 
has talent for sure, but he's all about pace. He's all about power. Um, he's he's drastic when he has to make a decision under pressure. And then you've got the cool Darlington Nagby that somehow sneaks in it too. Portland picked up a gem, and and that was their first season in Major League Soccer, if, I, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was. That changes the course of their of their MLS history in many ways. You, you don't go and do what Portland have done without Darlington Nagby there. And then they take a, a boatload of cash off Atlanta for him as well. Um arguably the best midfielder in the league so that's that's the one that that screams out at me because you watched Akron play back then and I was covering college soccer back then and, and uh, heavily and Nagby was just that guy who you had to grab you had to go and get him and you go for the power and the pace instead of that um, yeah that was a big miss for Vancouver Nicholas Bassenio from RSL in 2005 seems to be popping up on a bunch of lists. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. see that, that era it's so hard just because I don't know. It doesn't even feel like the same league anymore, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I think the college game feels so different, too. You know, like, you had a lot of misses at that time. Because I, I don't know if you had teams that, like Vancouver, I mean, even six years later, I don't know if they really had an identity. You know, it was their first year in the league, too. They didn't really know which what direction they wanted to go. So they went stereotype, speed power over a skilled player like Nagby, and they got it wrong. It's more of the recent ones that, I know your Philadelphias and a few others don't rate the draft. I think you're missing out potentially on a player who could be a surprise. You know, Pereira is the prime example of it. Pereira came to this country at 15 or so. He went through the, the high school game first and then club. Nobody knew who he was. And mm-hmm. nobody would know who he was without the draft. You know, D.C. wouldn't have found him. They wouldn't have found yeah. him in Roanoke. So... The draft can, can serve a need, and these, these guys like Kibanguchi, uh, Mabika at Kentucky, there's some later on. There, there's one that if he falls further down, I don't think he'll fall all the way to the second round. Danny Trejo um, is an attacking player that I really like. Uh, he's all over the map in the, in the mock drafts. He's it's from CSU Northridge. If you haven't noticed, yeah. I like finding these guys at the smaller schools. Because yeah, I think they're the no, diamonds you're, you're in the rough. Right. Matadors, baby. There you go. Tre- I'm looking at uh, last year's draft just as an example. Yeah. And like Miami, Miami had two picks and didn't pick Daryl DK. Yeah. And exactly. uh, they went for Dylan Nealis, who, you know, he's fine. Okay. He's just, yeah. Eh. You know, he's, he's grand. He's, he's, he's going to okay. do a decent job. I like Robbie Robinson. I actually think Robbie Robinson, Robbie Robinson will come good. But would um, you rather have DK or Robbie Robinson? Well, DK, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's so it show, so it should be considered a miss. You're right. Yeah, uh, Jack Jack Mare, at Nashville, complete miss for now. Uh, obviously, uh, Alistair Johnson uh, Johnston has has proved to be and better. That proved pick to be up. They got him at eleven. At 11. Yeah, yeah. So he, but but this is exactly it. The, a huge aspect of this has, to, and with any signing, has to be character, has yeah. to be their background, has to be their willingness to become a pro. There's a huge difference between being a college player that that has. You know, could have several months off from playing a game where you're having fun and enjoying yourself and, and you're obviously working hard in your studies too, kids. Do your homework. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's that aspect, but then there's the becoming a pro aspect. And this is why I look at those three that I mentioned today. Mayaka, you listen to everything, everything Mike Noonan has said about him. And he's just your, your consummate pro. He's, he's ready. Uh, Calvin Harris comes from a professional background. His father played at Middlesbrough. Pereira has has two parents that have been there every single every single step with him um and that he's willing to fight he he's he's got i like his story and i think he's someone that i'd invest in uh you know and obviously we've got the venezuela connection here in atlanta as well so that'd be pretty cool to see vamos lavino tinto huh Uh (laughs) all right so let me ask the both of you this in all of the time that you've seen the draft do you guys have a favorite moment from all of the times that you've covered the drafts that has stuck out in your mind as like, okay, I mean, that this, it's like the, the coolest thing that you've ever seen, whether it's a story for a particular player going to a particular destination. Is there one story that stands out for you on draft day that might be the personification of draft day? The, I, mean, I mean, I mentioned Matt Polster when he was picked, I think he was seven. In the draft, he, he just started bawling, crying. And he, he was speaking to the crowd up on the stage, and he's bawling, crying. Uh, and, and I like that. I like that because this is a kid that just grew up 
infatuated by the game and and always wanted to become a pro and next thing his name gets called out and there's that aspect of it that will always that will always ring true for me so uh yeah i'll, I'll probably pick that moment there's probably a million others that i'm i'm missing right now i mentioned being in the room on the uh the jack harrison day where he was picked and then traded uh when i used to go to the the nscaa convention now the united soccer coaches convention and they had the draft there I always made sure because I would go with soccer in the streets and it was always an opportunity to network and, and, and try to put together some different things for the organization. But I'd always make sure that I got in there early enough to go to the draft because it was always just fascinating to me. The one that I'd forgotten about that was wild to watch being in the room was Christian Roldan. A lot of people expected him to go really high in that draft and he just kept falling for some reason. He fell to 16. Wow. And to get rolled on at 16, and he was a, a University of Washington guy. I don't think Seattle had any idea that they would get Christian rolled on at 16. And everybody's like, why isn't he being picked? What is going on here? Uh, Jason, maybe behind the scenes, a few handshakes. Like, it's like an Aaron Rodgers <laughs> moment. You never know. That's what's crazy about it. But he goes at 16, and that's one of the best picks later in the first round that you'll ever find. Yeah, who's the best in, in MLS Super Draft history for you? Hmm. Just best pick or like best value for a pick? Overall, everything. I mean, like like you think of Clint Dempsey and the success that he's had. Hmm. You think about Josie. Uh, Josie dropped to seven, I believe. Um, uh, meaning six teams didn't go for him. He was only a kid, obviously. Out of uh, yeah. I think well, IMG right in Florida, so he there, there, Chad Marshall is one. Of, I think Jeff Laurentowitz should be up there. To be honest, two-time MLS Cup winner drops to ninety-third pick. Mm-hmm. Are you having a laugh? He's got. Are you be. having a laugh? <laughs> yeah. And and again, this is uh, same coach that's talking about Mayaka today is um, Mike Noonan was was Jeff's coach at Brown, and he said he was the most professional, the most enjoyable person to have on my team in my history coaching. Uh, he told us recently, Jeff Laurent to it. So I would, I would say Jeff, to be honest, I know I'm a little bit biased because I've known Jeff for a long time, but I think Jeff has to be up there for everything he offers a locker room and, and the success that he's had. Yeah, Jeff's got to be up there. Roldan's got to be up there. Um, Nagby, obviously, Wondolowski. you mentioned him. Wanda. Supplemental pick. Yeah, well, that, it's, it was just a way to extend the draft. They, they, they've had so many different formats for this thing. It's kind of ridiculous the way the draft has evolved yeah. over the years uh taylor twelman was a big yeah. draft pick for new england um second overall omar gonzalez aj de la garza omar. guys that were huge with the la galaxy omar is maybe one of the most impactful ones uh mm-hmm. go back to the first one eddie pope for dc eddie pope, yeah. um, out huge. of the college draft from north carolina what number did he fall you know he was number two in the initial college draft and i I don't even remember who was number one in that first one. But he wasn't a guy that people were saying would be what he turned into. Uh, Chad Marshall's another one. Jack Harrison has to be up there, too. Yep. And, and he, he will go on, I think, to play for England and, yep. and uh, to do great things. Maybe go back to Manchester City. The one thing I remember about that was Nelton Rodriguez, who had just taken over at the Chicago Fire, was so unbelievably, I, I'll use confident, as a euphemism, maybe for something else. He, <laughs> and he turned around and he says, after they traded Jack Harrison to NYCFC to take Brandon Vincent, who retired two years later, he said, we've just shocked the soccer world. And he said that on video. Hey, we've man. just shocked the soccer world. They did. Yeah, you have. You did shock the soccer <laughs> they world. They did. Well, no, I wouldn't say the world. You've shocked, shocked the soccer uh, community here in North America, but yes. for the wrong reasons, because it was yes. a terrible, terrible bit of business in the end. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Okay, so here to out. answer your question, Jason, mm-hmm. here's here's that 1996 MLS college draft. Who was number highlights. one? Matt McKeon from St. Louis University went to the Kansas City yeah, Wiz. He had a he had a good career, but yeah, not number one. Eddie Pope went number two. Mm-hmm. Some other highlights: round two, 17th overall to the LA Galaxy. Greg Vanny. Mm-hmm. 18th overall to the Tampa Bay Mutiny was Steve Ralston out of Florida International. That was a massive one because nobody knew anything about Steve Ralston, and he ended up having a great rookie year and having an incredible career. Then round three, 21st overall was some guy named Jesse Marsh who went to D.C. United. (laughs) 
Uh, 23rd, the San Jose Clash picked Eddie Lewis out of UCLA. 27th overall to the Galaxy, Ante Razov from UCLA. Wow. What a career he had. Top that's score your, in Chicago so Fire history. That's your 1996 yeah. highlights from the MLS College Draft. All over yeah. the map. Who knows what happens today, Kevin? I mean, we could be talking about uh, a pick. We could be talking about a trade. We could be talking about uh, a player in the second round that could be a surprise. <laughs> I don't know what we're getting into. It's going to be fun. No, and the best part about it all is we pick the brains of Carlos and Darren as well. There you go. We get their reasoning for what they're about to do. You know, they could very well pass. I just, I just think the only player I'd really jump on, the only one, maybe Mayaka, but the, the, the only one is, is Pereira for me. Uh, and and after that, I, I I think there's enough in reserve. You know, Jason, you know, and John, you know a lot more than me about what's coming through from the twos and and how close maybe a George Campbell could be in time to come. Um, how Efren's doing coming through, for example, that maybe they see centre back as a position of 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 wealth. You might need a bridge, though. You yeah. might need somebody who can come in and and handle themselves. For a year or two, and that could be like a Bauer, that could be a Kibben Gucci, who's in between the like Mesa and Robinson as seasoned pros, and mm-hmm. Campbell and Morales, who are teenagers. Get that early twenties yeah. guy who can come in and, and slot in. And it depends what Heinz thinks of Escobar. Is he a center also back true. or is he a fullback? Yep, uh, that's gonna. I'm. I'm. I, he's my. He's my one that I cannot wait to see play under Gabriel Lines. <laughs> yeah, I can't same. wait to see Escobar. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does to George Bello too. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting him. You know, no habla español. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> I. I. I wish I did speak Spanish now. To be honest, I need to. But uh, yeah, guys, I'll bounce because I live in Roswell, so I've got a little bit of a. I've got a longer drive than you, Jason. Yes. And <laughs> we need to be there. We are speaking to. Um, Machop early enough, I believe. So uh, we'll get there. We'll produce the show. We'll we'll get it done, and hopefully you guys can all join us a little bit later on. Yep, we'll be tweeting about it uh, throughout the day. We'll let you know what time that's going to air. So thanks for hanging out, Kevin. See you in a little bit. Excited. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Chat to you soon. Good, dude. Take care. Bye-bye. Kevin Egan, Kev underscore Egan on social media. Make sure you're following him. We'll we'll, we'll give you some some nuggets while, while we're doing all this. We will not be in the war room. No, Jason Nix. Uh, the war room will be at the family office today. We will be at Mercedes Benz stadium working with the production team over there to produce the show for you. It's going to air this evening on Atlanta United social media channels to recap everything that happens today. And look, I don't know what happens today. You know, as we just talked about for, you know, for 20, 25 minutes, like it could go in a lot of different directions this afternoon. They could easily get, Pereira, who I'm with Kevin, he if he's available, that's my pick. He could go in the first four. He probably should go in the first four, but he might yeah. not. They could go center back because I, I can absolutely buy into the reasoning that they need one more guy in there, and, and maybe he plays a good bit for the twos this year, but one more guy in the middle of that age range. You know, we, We've talked about that with the left back conversation when Edgar Castillo came in last year you wanted the veteran you get Mikey Ambrose now but you've got cover you need cover and and if you had injuries and if and I think it's an if if you see Franco Escobar as, as a right back you might say you know what I need one more guy in that center back category I need one more guy who can step in and you've got between Mabika, between Kibben Gucci, between Bauer, between Bartlow from Washington, who's a Generation Adidas guy, you've got players who have played you know, 40, 50, 60 games in college. Is that pro? No. But can they step in if you need it and do the job for you? I think all of them fit the profile of the kind of player that you would like. And a player like Mabika gives you something completely different with his size. Kibben Gucci's a little bit bigger, but he can play in the holding midfield as a potential situation too. And maybe you look at him in the holding midfield with the twos. You are looking at that full depth chart. Those are the positions I keep coming back to is Pereira because he's special. I could be special. And and I think in the draft, you can take a swing here because you've got a good roster to begin with. If you think he can turn into something special, you go grab him. Otherwise you're looking at your depth chart and you want to fill in gaps. And I think 
center back because it's a deep draft and center back you could go in that direction. I don't know if there's another position that is really something you need. I don't know if you need anybody outside back. I don't know if there's an outside back that you would look at unless it's later as a depth piece. You do have to look as well at what you're projecting for the twos this year. And that factors in. It doesn't mean you automatically get this player to go to the twos, but you can. We've seen them do that. you got to look at what the twos roster and the academy side looks like. You know, and you've got a couple players that it, it seems like are signed to twos deals, kind of dependent on what happens in the draft for them. If they get drafted, that second round pick, you might need to go get a right back if Brown gets drafted a- ahead of that. Because I don't know what the right back depth chart looks like coming out of the academy. You might say, you know what, let's, let's grab the guy here just in case. Um, you might look at it and say, you know, look, we need a left winger. If there's a left winger available in that second or third round, let's go ahead and grab them, see what they can turn into if we like it. Or you could trade out entirely. Everything's on the table today, in my opinion. So then let me ask this. When it comes to drafting a generation Adidas player versus not, how much of a difference would that make in a decision-making process? Well, you only have five, does it, you only have five generation Adidas players. So, I mean, it would only affect the number five pick. I, I don't think you're limited to only picking a generation Adidas guy there. If you like Bauer and you think he fills the need, you take Bauer. Um, if you like Kibben Gucci or Mabika, you take him. Uh, you don't have to take a generation Adidas player. I think it helps you a lot for a guy like Pereira because it gives him time. It, it, it factors into giving him more time to come good. And I think he needs it. I, I think he is one of the, the less seasoned guys that are, is at the top of the draft class. So y- you want to you wanna see what he can be. Um, Five is different, and you look at guys, and, and, and Byrne in the Twitch pitch has a good point. You know, Patrick Nielsen, we didn't get to see him at his best because of injuries, and, and what we saw, you know, they didn't see enough to keep him. Okay. Anderson Aseadu, later in the draft, you saw him with the twos. He didn't show enough that he would factor into the first team plans. You let him move on to a team where he can be a, a key player there in Birmingham. Miles, even where he was picked, needed some time. He was a younger guy, like Pereira. He was, a, I believe, a sophomore when he came out. He played two years. Pereira's played really one and a half years when you look at the craziness of, of 2020. You can pick him if he's Generation Adidas and give him some time because you've got a lot of central midfield options. But, as we've said, Eric Rometty's contract is likely up in the summer. Do you sign him to a new deal? Do you keep him around? Mo Adams uh, renewed a deal. I think he's good for the rest of the year. But if you bring in somebody that gives you the action that Mo Adams gives you, the ground that he covers, but is better in the final third, is that more of what you're looking for? These are the decisions you're looking at long term and why a guy like Pereira could factor in. You're not going to get Mayaka at five. He's not going to fall to five. Um, There's not a whole lot of other central midfielders that are in that mix at five, there could be some that are wild cards in the second or third round that you're looking at that could you t- could take a little bit more of a flyer. There's also some attackers there that you might want to take a chance on. Like I said, Trejo at, at uh, CSU Northridge, if he falls, absolutely jump on him. He's a guy with USL League 2 experience. He's a great 1v1 player. He could be the steal of the draft, in my opinion. Uh, he, he's one who jumps off the screen for me when I see him. Josh Penn, who has played for Indy 11 in USL Championship um, a couple different times. He played on an academy deal and, and played in 2019. He created three chances in, in five games, two starts. A good 1v1 player, good speed. He spent some time at Bronby in Denmark training. He's a young guy, he just turned 20. You know, he could be somebody that, that people take a chance on. There's some outside backs that are projects. You know, guys who are attackers at the college level who are converting to outside back. Brandon Bai has turned into a really good one in New England. Dewan Jones has turned into a really good one in New England. Tejon Buchanan has turned into a really good one in New England. Uh, you can go that route, and it works. Chris Albright made a career of it in, in MLS. He was an attacker in college. Didn't work for him at the pro level as an attacker. Became an outside back. Got national team opportunities out of it. You can go down that road and give them time with the twos to become that kind of player. It's 
the whole day is interesting to me. Everybody's going to talk about the five and what you do, but the lower picks, the second and third round picks, could end up being surprises, especially that early second round pick. You could really get a gem if you find the right guy with that one. Looking on the Twitters, uh, folks have been talking to each other about the draft, which is always very cool. Uh, Nathan Pugh says, like an idiot, I looked at a mock draft. The, they, this particular mock draft had Atlanta taking Kim and Gucci. More depth and competition there makes sense. This is all new to hindsight. I wonder how he's built his wish list. I don't think he's built a wish list as much as he's built a, I'm looking for players who can do this. You know, I don't know if if Gabriel Heinze's watched tape on these guys. Maybe he has. Maybe they've narrowed it down to these are the guys we think will be available. These are the guys that we're looking at. How do you rank them? Who do you like here? Does anybody jump off the page to you? Or if not, with that five, then let's let's trade out and let's see what we can get. You don't need to trade right now because of the way this could go. And the mock drafts are all over the place. The draft could be completely different than all the mock drafts. You know, I think your best three players in the draft are Mayaka, Harris, and Pereira. After that, you've got two other generation Adidas players in Bartlow and Halsey, who were later signings. You've got a player like Ed Kizza, who Ivis Galar separates really high. He didn't play this year at Pitt. He, he left the program uh, for personal reasons that nobody really knows. But this is a guy who scored 31 goals in 53 games at Pitt. That's a proven goal scorer. There's teams who need a proven goal scorer coming out of college. You can step right in. Daryl DK, for example. You've got the Kibben Gucci's. You've got the Bowers from smaller schools. You've got a Mabika who's just fascinating at 6'6", 215. You've got a, a good wide player in Kamarni Smith at Clemson. Uh, you've got a good player who can play wide or play up top in David Egbo from Akron. Beyond those first three... I could see so many different things happening, but I could also see Pereira falling out of that because of teams with needs. That's where picking at five is so interesting because you could pick a player based off need, you could pick the best available, or you could trade it to somebody who is desperate to get a player that they need. And you want to wait and see how it plays out. Pereira could be there at five, and somebody could come up and say, we'll give you $200,000 in allocation money for him, and you'd probably take that yeah. because you can make that work in a different way. Um, it's all up for grabs. It's a, a really good question. Uh, no Playoff NASCAR on the Twitch pitch said, do you expect the second and third round picks will be used on guys like Steedman, Javain Brown, et cetera, by default? Steedman maybe not because he's only signed to an Atlanta United 2 deal, and I don't know if you project him as making it to the first team. I don't know where Steedman falls in terms of the depth chart just yet. We didn't see a ton of him this year. And in the mock drafts, he's all over the place. Um, some are rating him as high as like mid-first round. And if somebody picks him, then he'll have an opportunity. You'll have his USL rights. And this is the thing to keep in mind. We had the situation with Dylan Castanera. Castanera signed a, an Atlanta United 2 deal, then was drafted by Dallas, and Atlanta United liked him. He was a good, he's a good goalkeeper. I mean, Miami's ended up signing him. He's a very good goalkeeper. He could have signed an MLS deal here and been the number three, but you didn't have his MLS rights. Dallas wanted more than you were willing to give, so you couldn't sign him. With Brown... With uh, Steedman, if you rate them as potential MLS players, yeah, you might use those second and third round picks to go ahead and grab their MLS rights. This is something, and Byrne says it shouldn't be permitted, and it gets into this. It's, it's awkward because of the differences between MLS and USL. You can't bypass the MLS super draft and get a player's MLS rights by signing them to a USL deal. I get that. Maybe there should be a cap on what those rights go for to where it's more like the discovery right situation where we see, yeah, I've got my discovery list. And, and yes, New York Red Bulls, you had Miguel Almiron on your discovery list, but he's not signing for you. He's not going to you. So we're going to give you $50,000 to get his rights. Maybe there's a cap on it. Maybe that's the way you do it because teams would use their USL team to to bypass the draft if they could. You've got to avoid that. But, yeah, the Casanera situation is frustrating. 
Uh, Adam from 816, what's up, Adam? Hope you're doing well out in Kansas City land. Uh, trying to catch up, were there any big-name homegrown signings around the league this week that would have been high draft picks? There wasn't anybody like we've seen in the past where you thought they were going to go high because they were already in mock draft situations and they were already being looked at in the draft. Um, and then they signed a homegrown deal. There wasn't anybody who fell into that. Machoke Chole's the interesting one because I don't know where he would have been projected. Um, I think he would have went at least middle of first round if he had went into the draft. I think when you look at the list of players and you look at the the positional rankings especially, which is what some folks started to do uh, yesterday, and we'll go to Ivis Glarseps because I, I, I think Ivis put so much work into covering the draft and he, he does great work with it. Let's look at wingers wide forwards. Calvin Harris is ranked number one. Okay. Kamarni Smith, number two. All right. Then it's Derek Dodson. It's Josh Penn. It's Justin McMaster from Wake Forest. I would take Machoke Chole over his college team, make McMaster. So that puts him at least at five. I would put him ahead of Penn and Dodson. I would put him at least the third best winger or wide forward available in the draft if Chole went into that. Potentially number two. I, I could easily take him over Kamarni Smith because Kamarni Smith would take up an international slot and Chol will not. That's big. So put him second. He might be the biggest one that signed a homegrown deal that would have went in the draft. But we just didn't get those guys that far in the conversation. So I don't know where they would have ranked, to be perfectly honest. A couple of other folks on Twitter with draft thoughts this morning. Chris Hutchison is requesting that Kevin Egan bring back the blue suit. <laughs> I don't think he's going blue suit today. I think we're going a little more casual. Uh, Tafka has his poll up for everyone to answer about uh, what they think Atlanta, uh, what does Atlanta do? Not what they should do, but what do they do? Oh, yeah. I wanted to and, see what the uh, the poll results were at this point. So I think I have to vote in it. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, so let me grab that and let's see where Tafka's poll is because we retweeted that to see where things fall. Um, we've had a lot of commentary, so we will get to that quickly so we can wrap up because we got to wrap up as close to 11 as possible. Uh-huh. I think they take a player at five. Yeah. Uh, most people think they take a player at five. 37 votes so far. Keep getting in on that. Uh, Tafka, you got to set your polls to, to time to end before things <laughs> can actually happen. But as of right now, uh, 59.5% of people think they pick a player at 5. 27% think they trade away for assets. Uh, 108 think they trade back for assets. So get a later first-round pick and get some assets. Uh, only a handful think they trade up. I don't, I don't see them trading up unless they really rate Pereira. Yeah. And they could. I, I do. I think he's that good. I, he could go three. He could go two. Um, I think he's that talented. I would, I would take him with any of those spots. He would be the player that I would want to see at this point, um, just in general. And when you start getting the teams and needs, then it could be it gets to a different conversation. But I don't think they trade up. I think that's the least likely. Rich Ransom says, "I loved going to the MLS Super Draft as a live event at the coaches' convention in Philly. Highlights: one, Mark Abbott threatening to kick out the sons of Ben for booing Don Garber. They were a little over the top with the booing. Yes." Number two, Andre Blake getting drafted number one by the union and Zach McMath there as an attendee storming out of the hall to call his agent and demand a trade loudly in the lobby. I did not witness that. That's amazing. Sorry, Zach number, McMath. He keeps getting number, screwed. And number three, overhearing Chicago and sporting Kansas City officials doing a trade while in the restroom. Good times. That's good times. Um, <laughs> never saw anything like that. I just remember the buzz about Roald on because I think he was projected – originally like a top five and he just kept falling and falling and everybody's like what every pick it's like what it's weird very uh let's see oh there's your uh, there's the results thank you for clicking onto that uh other folks have other non-draft thoughts on the twitter sure we'll well. take all of it right now all right so uh nathan pew in our discussion in the first half hour wanted to know uh the first manager to get canned is zidane or lennon uh, sadly, I think they both I make think, it to the off season. Sadly, I think it's Zidane who would leave the job before Lennon would. Um, yeah. Celtic should have already fired Lennon, but they won't for some reason. Uh, then the other question from Nathan Early: uh, De Bruyne potential injury deal or no deal? 
no deal. Uh, is it a deal? Wait a minute. Say that again? Hey, uh, Nathan wants to know, De Bruyne potential injury, deal or no deal? I'm guessing like big deal or no deal is, is what he's kind of saying. It, it, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal if it is a potential, if it, there's an injury. They yeah. are not the favorite to win the league if he's injured for an no. extended period of time, in, in my opinion. If he misses more than, than four games, I don't think they're the favorite. I think United mm-hmm. is. Um, yeah. If he is available and doesn't miss more than four games, they can get by for a few games here. But if he misses a bunch, they're in trouble. Yeah. Well, they're, I mean, they're not going to be awful, but they're, they're not yeah. going to be title contending, title winning, let's say. They'll be contending. They won't be winning. Right. Uh, random Thursday thought from Nathan. He heard on the radio the other day about inertial mass and the theory that as objects go faster, they gain more mass, meaning that a ship flying at a speed of light is an impossibility because the effective mass drag would be too much. Sure. That is a Thursday. Sure. Sure. That's a, thir- that's a Thursday thought. Woo! Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Colonel is in this morning with a, with a Swansea. Uh, Steve Cooper, manager to the press on Jordan Morris, quote, it's not quite done yet, but in the process of getting done, it's taking a little longer than we would have liked, basically down to logistics more than anything else. When it does get done, we'll be really pleased, end quote. So Jordan Morris not over the finish line yet at Swansea. Well, he has uh, left training camp with the U.S. men's national team uh, to take care of, I believe it was personal matters is the way it was described, yeah. um, or an undisclosed reason. Uh yeah, that's the reason. We all know what the reason is. Yeah. Um, Sean Johnson yeah. also left national team training camp because of a knee strain. He said it's minor. He's not going to play on the game on the 31st. Uh, I don't think it's expected to hold him back from playing for NYC. Also on the board, Chris Hutchison. Words to live by by Jarrett Smith. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. It's And I'll true. add to that. I'll add to that. If, if it's only cheating, if you get caught. Uh, I don't know about that. Ryan Lee said that uh, when I read the Apolinsky and Associates, he said I wasn't fast. I had pace. He'd say nine and a half out of ten. I seemed very confident. No, it was good. It was it was your best performance. There's no question about it. Uh, Tafka linking to Tariq Panja, who says in one of his uh, information sessions this morning, uh, FIFA and six global confederations have signed an agreement to bar any player that takes part in a breakaway Super League from playing in a World Cup or regional events like Euros. The declaration comes amid mounting speculation of the breakaway European Super League. Tafka goes, is this for real? It's a bunch of posturing. Um, If FIFA could make money from a Super League, they would do it. Mm -hmm. They are doing what they're supposed to do right now. They're backing the confederations because if a Super League happened, that would be pulling teams out of their domestic competitions and be affecting FIFA members. If FIFA created their own Super League, then they would not be doing this because it's a whole different situation. Um, There's so much up in the air with what's going on with, is is it real? Is there a real conversation about a Super League? Is it still fictional? Is it still, you know, theoretical? Um, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I mean, remember Bartomeu on his way out the door in Barcelona, the former president was like, oh yeah, and I signed up for the, the Super League. It's like what? What does that mean? Like it's uh-huh. not even a thing. Like what? What are you talking about? Um, so is there something? Is there not? I, nobody really seems to know, and it's all theory on if it would work or not. You know, I, I think it's a valid question. If Bayern Munich, for example, is in a Super League and instead of winning the Bundesliga every year or almost every year, if they finish tenth out of twenty, is is that gonna? diminish who Bayern Munich is or does it still resonate because they're part of the Super League and they're consistently playing Real Madrid and Barcelona and Chelsea and and Manchester United etc etc I don't have the answer to that nobody does it's all speculation that's all I guess Um, I still think the way they're going to end up heading this off is they're going to create the Champions League to be bigger and to have two tiers of qualifiers. They're going to have a tier that is your heritage mega clubs. And they're going to have maybe not complete and utter certainty of qualifying every year for the Champions League, but pretty close. And if they have a group of, 
I'm, I'm, I'm making this up off the fly, so this is, this is the theory part of it. If they have a group of 20 teams that say that they wanted to do a Super League, right? And they say, all right, we're going to do the Champions League. And instead of the way qualification goes now, that still happens, but we'll tweak it. Out of you, 20, 16 are guaranteed spots every year. And four get bumped into having to qualify a different way or competing for it. Or we can freshen that up that get in based off if somebody emerges as a top team in Italy or Spain or, or whoever and bumps one of you out. Okay. You know, you do like a three-year relegation system like they do in, in – what they were doing in Mexico, like they do in Argentina when they bring that back, uh, like some leagues do. Maybe. I don't know. But I think that's what will happen is it will be an expanded Champions League where the group stage will be more than six games. It will be more like 12. Um, more midweek games. Teams are going to have to have bigger rosters. They would expect to be making more money, so you could see that. I don't think that ends up helping the rest of the leagues, the rest of the teams in these leagues, to be perfectly honest, because I think the the teams that are in the Champions League all the time are going to have more money to spend. And they're going to gobble up more players to have bigger rosters. So your your good players at smaller Premier League teams, for example, would end up as a you know fourth or fifth forward for a Manchester City to fill the spot. It, it's it's weird, like. I don't think they end up doing a Super League because I, I think they'll block it. I think it'll get held off. But I think they'll take Super League ideas and put them into the Champions League. Yeah. And they'll try to create a compromise situation that I think will be worse than either one. Worse than going with the status quo or worse than going with a Super League. I, I, I don't know what they do. Uh, Johannes says the irony in all of the European Super League idea is that it's more closely aligned to what MLS is than what normal leagues are. It wouldn't be pro-rel, it would be a closed system, with just the super leagues, or super clubs. I, I won't believe it until I actually see, since it's been talked about for decades. I think the pressure ends up changing the Champions League. And I think you create two tiers of qualification. Your super clubs, where most of them get into every Champions League, but not all, because you have to have some up for grabs. And then your traditional qualification. So it'll be a spot like, let's say, let's take Chelsea, for example. Chelsea would be one of the super clubs. So they would be able to qualify if they are whatever, whatever system you set up, whatever past Champions League success, domestic success, all of it. You create a formula, and if they don't qualify for that large number of the super clubs that get in, they could qualify if they win the Premier League. They would take that spot. So they would qualify through a different way. I, I think you create some kind of weird, funky system that way. I, I think it's all it's all going to be a compromise that ends up being worse in the long run. Caught up on the Twitters. What else is going on? Uh, Jason Nix wants to talk about the story of the year so far. Uh, Newport County goalkeeper Tom King has broken the Guinness World Record for the longest goal scored in a competitive football match. I think a lot of people have seen it. 105-yard yeah. shot. I don't know if it was exactly a shot, but it ended up being a shot. He's going to claim it. Um, Newport County drew 1-1 in the match. The longest one previously was Stoke City goalkeeper Asmir Begovic. Longest goal ever. Yeah, I remember I I looked at the the one from Newport County, and that was just an absolute rocket that he had, and it had a nice convenient hop to it and went over and it went in. So, uh, cool. Good, cool for you for Guinness. Nicely done. Yes. Turner Kirby says, just saw the MLS statement. Why do leagues and PAs try to win the battle of public opinion instead of, you know, getting a deal done? I agree. Um, I would have skipped this if I was mm-hmm. the league. I would have left that out. I understand why they put it in because they made the first step to negotiating. They triggered the force majeure, which was agreed to in the summer. They followed the protocols on it. I'm assuming, I, I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming they followed the, the contractual obligations and they have submitted a proposal that has been essentially ignored. I, I, I understand the league's frustration. I still yeah. wouldn't have included this today. I would not have done that the way they did because I don't know if it helps. I get their frustration and I think it's valid. They've put an offer on the table through the means that both sides agreed to do, and they're not getting a response. That's disappointing. 
the MLSPA needs to respond, even if it's to say, no, we're not going to do anything. What's your next move? I don't think that's the right move, but okay. Both sides are going to lose stuff here. It's just real. Alex Bassine says, I don't understand how this is different than any other labor dispute. Both sides always go public, and that's totally true. I, yeah. It doesn't help either way. I think what's different in this situation for me is that we're dealing with something abnormal because it's it's a pandemic. We're dealing with a force majeure clause for the first time. Um, instead of it's the end of the agreement and they're signing a new agreement. So it, it, it's a little bit different dynamic. I don't like the posturing that the Players Association started with. Because they came out and they said initially, like, we don't think you could do this. You should do this. You can't do this. It's not right. We're not going to even entertain giving anything back. We're not going to entertain a pay cut. I, I think they triggered the, the way this has played out with that yeah. stance. Yeah. Um, because there's not a lot of room to work in here with this. And the thing that I, I just I don't know if people are paying attention to the game worldwide to understand MLS talking about losses is not any different than Real Madrid talking to Sergio Ramos and saying, yeah, we'll offer you a, a two-year deal, but you're going to have to take a pay cut to do that, that 10% pay cut. And, oh, yeah, we need your help because we need everybody to take a 10% pay cut. At Real Madrid. Yeah. Barcelona's deferred money. You know, Liga, and there's different issues with Liga because of the broadcast thing falling apart, but they're talking about huge pay cuts. You've got Leicester, who's at the top of the Premier League right there, who's on their eighth loan right now. I mean, going, going up against their TV revenue for next season. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a real conversation that players around the world are giving help to the owners of the teams. And I know it's different situations because some of those teams have an owner that is, is rich or maybe was rich or maybe he's not as rich as they, they have portrayed themselves to be. Others have membership like Barcelona and have just been poorly run. All that plays into it. But the idea that there are losses and questioning the idea that there's losses, I just, I, that feels crazy to me. Um, the idea of not even talking about how to help the league with losses, I, I don't think it's the right approach. I don't think it's – I don't like it. That's just that, – that's my take. I yeah. understand the players not wanting to give anything else back. They feel like they gave back a lot. But they agreed to that in the last CBA. Now they don't want to talk about anything with 21, and I just don't see how 21 is normal anytime soon. Maybe I mean, even 22 to some degree, or at least early on. Well, business-wise, yes, but fans will be in the building by 22. I don't think there's any question about that. Fans will be fully in the building in 21 later in the year, but we don't know when. Right. I mean, when, when you, you hear the news this morning about there was no plan to, to get the vaccines out and there's no way to modify the plan because there wasn't a plan to begin with in this country, then it's like, okay, great. This is, this is wonderful. This is what we need to get people in the buildings. So I don't know. I just I, I don't know. It's none of it's helping. The stance initially from the players, the owners coming back after you issued the the proposal and didn't get a response, and then having a media availability quickly, then the players having a media availability where they're ticked off. Uh, Bob Foose, the the head of the players' association, is angry. Now this none of it is 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 pushing things in the right direction. Um, you really need to work together here. And there's a lot of people who don't have a seat at that table that are going to get affected by it. And that's not cool. They need to work this out. Um, Jason Nick says, is all this uh, MLS CBA garbage going to delay the start of training for MLS teams? It has to, right? I I, I think so. Um, The players have said they don't know when they're supposed to start training. Teams have said January 25th for a while now. Yeah, that's what was said here. It's what Giovanni Savarese said at the United Soccer Coaches Convention. Um, others, like Peter Vermes, has said we're looking at February 1st or February 8th to start. So I don't know if this is affecting it. 
or MLS doesn't know when they want to start yet because of the financial implications of having more games behind closed doors, it is all up in the air, and it needs to get buttoned down, and that's why they all need to get in the room and do it. And that needs to be part of the conversation is, look, we're all working together here. The teams are going to lose money this year. There's no way around that because you're not going to have full venues day one. You're not going to have a full stadium every game this season. So you're going to lose money. There, there's no way to argue, say, oh, well, no, you're not. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you are. You are. Like, there's, there, that's, just, that's, that's reality. You don't know how long. That's the unknown. And that's where they need to work together because nobody knows. The owners don't. The players don't. The Players Association doesn't. Mayors don't. Governors don't. The president doesn't know. You don't know when it's going to be completely comfortable and safe and available to open every venue 100%. Nobody knows that. So the arguing about, well, we think it's going to be this percentage. We think it's going to be this percentage. None of you know. Sit down and work together to figure this out. Be adults about it, please. Mm-hmm. Stop the posturing. It's not helping. A uh, quick trade note, uh, and I was focused more on the dollars that are being uh, associated here. Nashville has uh, traded a 2021 international spot in the club's second round selection at number 46 in the Super Draft to Vancouver for $175,000 in general allocation money and the Whitecaps second round selection at 36. In addition, Nashville will send uh, general allocation money to Vancouver based on performance benchmarks of the players selected. You're swapping second round picks that aren't very that far apart. The international slot's the most important thing there. There you go. Uh, so Burns that- says there's lots of talk in Europe about the Olympics getting canceled. Um, I believe either the IOC or the organizing committee in Japan came out and said, we're doing it. No matter what, we're doing it. So that's another one. Um, yeah. Uh, I agree with Bern. I think they can do the Euros. They can do Copa Americas. They can do the Gold Cups. They, they can figure those out and get those done. The Olympics is going to be hard because I don't think they can do all the qualification processes for all the different sports between now and the Olympics. It's a lot. Uh, the MLSPA has responded to the letter this morning. Um, at us next time is what the MLSPA said. That's stop, guys. Stop. It, it's stop. Everybody. Stop trying to win points on social media. Stop trying to get more likes. Stop trying to get people ratioed. Stop all that stuff because it's not real life. It's just not. Sit down at a table and, and be adults. We're dealing with a global pandemic that nobody has ever seen before in our time in these leagues. It's going to take cooperation. It's going to mm-hmm. take owners cooperating with the players it's going to take the league working with their owners and the players to get through all of this so we don't lose teams so we don't lose jobs so we bounce back quicker because there is a responsibility from all of the people involved that is greater than the paycheck that is greater than the revenue that is greater than your contract. There's a responsibility to all of you people who listen to this show, who love the game, who need the game right now, who need a distraction, because you're dealing with bigger things. You're dealing with more challenges. Yeah, sports has a very important role in that. And that needs to be understood by everybody who is posturing for likes and trying to pop off the perfect tweet to get a bunch of attention or the perfect letter to get a bunch of attention You guys have a bigger responsibility to, yes, the world at large. We've seen it in leagues all over the world right now. Sports is a much-needed distraction from real life. There are people dealing with much harder things than a 5% or a 10% pay cut. You guys have a responsibility. So stop the posturing. Get into the Zoom room. Talk and figure it out so there's not a delay. So fans have a distraction from real life because they need it. It's one of the number one things that motivated me all last year preparing for games. Fans saying, man, I needed this. I needed something to take my mind off of my own worries. You guys have a responsibility. MLSPA, MLS, everybody involved, please remember that as opposed to winning Twitter. 
doesn't win anything. Hopefully, grown-ups will come into the room at some point. Hopefully. Amen. Got to have hope, right? That's where we are right now. Got to have hope. Um, Mm -hmm. Draft day is all about hope. I'm excited for the kids who are going to get drafted today. I'm excited for these players. I'm excited for the opportunities that are going to be presented to them. I hope they don't have to wait too long for that to happen. Um, I don't think they will, but I don't like the posturing that is starting to make you think they might have to wait a little bit longer. This is a big day for the kids who get drafted. They get a chance to, to live out a professional dream. So it's exciting. I'm glad we're getting a part to tell the story of whatever Atlanta United does today. And it could do a lot of different things. It's going to be a really interesting story to tell. So make sure you're following me on Twitter, Longshoe, Kevin Egan, Kev underscore Egan, A-T-L-U-T-D. We're going to tell that story. We'll have some tweets during the day, but the recap show will come out this evening. Uh, once we know the final time, I think in the 7 or 7.30 range, we'll tweet that out and share it with you. Um, hopefully you can join us. Looking forward to it. It's going to be fun today, and we'll recap all of it again tomorrow morning. Thanks for hanging out. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha draft day, y'all.